All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started because uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Eric Spina and, and Jen Howe with us today. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ray Blakeney, and I'm president of the Alumni Association, and I'm thrilled to have our guest today to have a conversation from our porch. You will notice that I am not on a porch. I am inside. I live just outside of Seattle, and, and true to form, it is raining in Seattle. So I've, I've moved inside. Um, but as you could see, both Jen and Eric are on their porches. Um, I'll be back in a bit, but I thought perhaps we'd start with some opening remarks and hellos from Jen and Eric. So Jen, uh, you're on your porch somewhere in the East Coast, so I'll let you jump in and go first. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Um, hey, I'm Jen Howe, Vice President for University Advancement, and really thrilled to join so many alumni, parents, friends, and even students tonight. Uh, I know we have registered to participate. It's a really great opportunity um, to connect with you guys personally when we can't do so in person, and just share some of the excitement we have about the fall semester uh, that is upon us not, not too long from now. And uh, just grateful for all of you that have decided to join us tonight um, and the time and the interest that you have in how the university is moving forward. So welcome and look forward to the conversation. Awesome, thanks Jen. Eric. Good evening everyone, uh, Eric Spina here. Um, entering my, actually I'm now in my fifth year as president, hard, hard to believe, time flies. But one of the joys that I know Jen, have, Jen and I have had over our four years at UD is uh, meeting so many of you uh, here in Dayton uh, across and across the country. And uh, especially in this time of, of pandemic when we're not able to get on the road, really wonderful to be able to engage with you in, in this way. Look forward to uh, taking this conversation tonight where, where, where you would like to. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Um, so we should have a fun format. At today we're going I have a couple of questions to get us started this conversation is only going to be as fun and as meaningful as the questions that we get from all of you um, Eric just mentioned the pandemic and I was reflecting upon what the past few months have been on February 29th uh, I got a note from uh, one of our senior leaders at Microsoft that we had in King County uh, where Microsoft is based the first COVID death in the US March 1st, I left Dayton, Ohio to fly back to Seattle. And by the time I got back to Seattle, there was another message from our senior leadership team that we're now reassessing. And by March 3rd, we decided to close the Microsoft campuses. What's interesting is I lead a recruiting function. And by March 4th, we had transitioned all of our interviews to virtual interviews. So in a single day, we went from having in-person interviews, people flying to Seattle or to any of our locations to, uh, for us, a Teams interview. And we did that for thousands of uh, interviews, thousands of candidates within a couple of days. And what was interesting, we had the greatest productivity in interviews that we'd ever have. We moved all of our interviews virtually. And so we're learning how to deal in this new COVID environment. And one of the things that UD is doing is the same. Uh, thinking about how its operations will work. And I know top of mind for many of you out there is you've seen UD's reopening plan. So the first question is, Eric, tell us about the fall and what you expect uh, as the fall and, and the school year begins. Oh, thank, thanks for maybe the first thing I'd say about the pandemic is um, when the next pandemic comes along, we're gonna be so well prepared <laughs> for learning in this pandemic. If another one comes along, I'm leaving town. Uh, ser seriously, I mean, the first thing that I, I really should say is um, really the, the whole Flyer community is really banded together during this time. It's been, been wonderful to see supporting each other. Uh, you know, people have been very patient, very understanding, given leadership, you know, the kind of grace I think we need to try to just fi figure out our bearings in a very uncertain world. I mean, that's been the most difficult thing, and I'm sure, in everyone's life. There's just so much that's not not known. Um, I, I won't give you the full three hours in terms of what the reopening plan is, but just indicate that we've been working really since uh, probably April on what reopening campus would look like. Uh, we've been working with a terrific panel of, uh, of doctors uh, locally with all the right, right specialties um, who are advising us you know, in terms of what we need to do to open. Uh, they'll be advising us through, through the semester as, as we monitor the situation working very closely with um, 
folks in, in Columbus, uh, but also right here in Montgomery County working with a public health commissioner. So just at a very high level, I'll touch on a few things. Uh, we're gonna move students in over a period of two weeks. They'll start on, on August 8th through August 22nd. We're bringing a certain number each day. We feel that's the best way to get people in safely without cross contamination. Uh, and classes will begin on August 24th as has long, long been, been planned. We have a very comprehensive uh, testing and contact tracing plan. Uh, in, in case anyone does does get sick, we we do obviously expect some uh, some some infections. Hopefully, uh, hopefully no one no one too too sick. Um, we are setting expectations, and I, I think people expect the kinds of things we're we're setting in terms of mask wearing, certainly in indoor environments, uh, certainly outdoors if you can't socially distance. Um, but you know, social distancing wherever ever possible. Many parts of the campus, um, certainly classrooms, but also dining halls, are being reconfigured to support social social distancing. Right now in Ohio, people aren't allowed to gather in more than groups of ten, uh, so so that that'll be another important cor cornerstone. Um, and we have a, a group of students, faculty, and staff working together in terms of how we communicate to the whole campus community about our commitment to the community and our commitment to each other to keep each other safe, the things that we have to do, not only for ourselves, but, but, but for others as, as well. Um, classrooms, as I mentioned, have been, been thinned out and, and there'll really be three kinds of classrooms. Those that are fully in-person, uh, those that are fully online and those that are, that are hybrid. Um, our goal, and I, I think we'll be able to achieve that, is, uh, is to have at least 75% of our classes with some in-person component. Um, and really the challenge here is primarily uh, size of classrooms and number of classrooms that we have, have to work with. We will end on-campus instruction just before thank Thanksgiving. Uh, students will go home and we'll, we'll have the last couple weeks of the semester with students at home. We simply don't wanna reassemble everyone back on campus as they go across, across the country. Um, so that's, you know, I mean, that, that's, those are the, the, the headlines, um, as I said, um, you know, our, our, the key here is flexibility for everyone. You know, we've had to pivot in several areas already. And, and we know between now and students arriving, there'll be things that are, that are changed that we're gonna have to respond to. And, and through the semester, really agility, flexibility, patience, understanding, and ultimately grace are key. But we think it's so important to have our students back on campus where they definitely want to be. Our faculty and staff have been working so hard and students on, on these, these plans and, and really looking forward to, uh, to, to seeing how we execute. I have a lot of confidence in our, our community. Thanks, Eric. Jen, any, anything from your perspective on the fall and what you're looking forward to and challenges you think we'll be facing? Sir, I mean, it is gonna be different on campus. I mean, let's face it, um, you know, what makes UD great is the people. Uh, whether it's the people who you know are there every day or our alumni parents and friends who have that wonderful sense to gravitate back to campus and teach in classes and mentor our students and get with one another and celebrate and you know honestly to keep our faculty and our staff and our students successful uh, healthy and to get through to that Thanksgiving point that Eric talked about you know I think you know many people won't be surprised to know that you know advancement's doing their part we are either canceling or postponing um, most of our, if not all of our alumni, parent, and uh, donor events on campus. Uh, and you know, that includes big things. I mean, we had to walk away from re doing reunion earlier this year. Uh, Parents Weekend, Black Alumni Weekend. Uh, we'll move virtually uh, for not only the Board of Trustees, but our Alumni Leadership Conference, uh, our School and Unit Advisory Councils this fall all with the idea that there are some elements of this that we can build out virtually uh, with key stakeholders, but recognizing that, you know, this is gonna be a big change for everyone, um, you know, but it does make sense in terms of what will make the UD community thrive and what is a really challenging time. Uh, I guess I kind of equated, I was talking with someone earlier today, I'll put it in flyer terms. It's like a closed practice, right? If we could just be okay with a few closed practices over the fall, maybe we get to the other side of this thing and we get to see some wins again uh, in person. So um, anyways, I, I just, I, I think it's important for us to understand we really need to have campus and those spaces that are set up for classroom instruction and that personal experience that every alum and parent wishes for our current student population. 
that's going to mean that some of us can't be physically present, at least for the short term. Thanks, Jen. And both Eric and Jen, thank you for um, your response. But I, what I'm blown away with is the thoughtfulness of the plan, um, how you're taking advice from experts, and then really being thoughtful uh, about keeping our students, uh, our staff, our faculty safe. Um, it's no um, short undertaking. And so just again, um, uh, love the thoughtfulness of it. And, and Jen, one of the things that I'd just like to comment from an alumni association point of view is how closely we've been able to partner in talking through these issues, uh, how much visibility you've given us in terms of what the university is thinking. Um, and so in times like these, I really appreciate um, our great partnership that we've had. Um, so thank, thank you both for those responses. Eric, one of the things that I think many people, uh, you know, you and I and Jen, and I'll probably all in this uh, call care a lot about is athletics. And we're starting to hear from different conferences and different schools um, about what's going to happen in, uh, for fall sports and maybe impacting winter sports. So can you give an update on, on how UD is thinking about sports for the fall and beyond? Sure. So let me just talk about beyond first. So to this point, uh, the Atlantic 10, really all conferences have not made any decisions about winter sports. So here we can think about men's and women's basketball and obviously not spring yet either. So those, no, no, no changes yet. I mean, obviously there's gonna be some challenges we expect in, in no November when, when basketball season starts. Uh, but you know, certainly to us and so, so many schools, um, you know, th there's, there's a lot of work to be done as we think about basketball. But for, for the fall, obviously, we have some incredible student athletes who've been preparing uh, for their, their season, coaches preparing as well. Um, it's been re really, really tough. Neil Sullivan has been keeping in, in great touch with the coaches and the student athletes, keeping them informed as uh, there have been a lot of conversations in both the Atlantic 10 as well as our football conference, the Pioneer Football League. And, and just this past week, uh, the Atlantic 10 made the decision to suspend uh, across all of their sports uh, competition for this fall. Now we have created a, what we're calling a look-in window on September 15th. Uh, we'll take a look at the situation, the pandemic uh, across the country and in our region on September 15th. And if something has changed, I'm gonna say pretty dramatically, uh, the athletic directors will work with the coaches to see if a, a meaningful seasons could be put together for some or all of the sports in, 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 the, in the fall. And if not, then we're gonna pivot all those sports to the spring. So it's gonna be a little, little bit different uh, having those sports compete in the spring. Um, but we, we think that's, you know, just in terms of ensuring safety uh, for the student athletes, just following the protocols with these student athletes is, is so, so important. And, um, you know, as we're just learning to live on campus, it probably is gonna be enough just to figure out how to go to class and, and live, live in, in community. Uh, Pioneer Football League is a little bit behind in terms of uh, its considerations. I expect we'll be having some decisions in the next week or so. Uh, but but we, we've already set aside our, our three non-conference non games. So uh, we want to make certain that if we do play football this fall, it'd be a meaningful season for our football players, our student athletes. Um, it, it's, it's possible that that also will, will pivot to the spring. Got it. Thanks, Eric. Um, and so just a reminder to everyone on the call, the quality of this conversation is up to you and the great questions that, that you send. And I see a few questions already coming in. And so um, to either Eric or Jen, you know, one of the things, and Jen, you touched upon this, one of the things that makes UD UD is just inter the ability to interact with one another and the community and their alums. Um, a couple of the questions that have come in, one was around, hey, I'm in the area, I'm in the area, I'd love to help move students in. And the other is, how will students interact with the Dayton community at large, which is some of the great work that our student clubs do in interacting with the city of Dayton, schools in Dayton. So as we think about all the folks that want to interact with the UD community, how are we thinking about that interaction uh, for the school year? Yeah, it's a, a great question. And, and frankly, it's a difficult answer. It's an answer that I don't like giving and I think people aren't gonna like to hear. And, you know, let's just, first of all, hope that by the time we get to spring or certainly next year, we have either greatly enhanced therapeutics or vaccines that will allow us to, to really change things. But, um, you know, to Jen's earlier point, we really need to keep campus 
for our students, faculty, and staff. So we're going we're gonna to be doing very little in terms of on and off campus, in terms of having people come from off campus in, into uh, an environment that we hope is going to be as, as free as possible with COVID-19. So even something like, you know, uh, aunt and uncle living locally want to help their nephew move in. Uh, that's something we'd love to have happen, but you know those two additional people or three additional people on campus, you know, is, is going to be something that potentially disrupts the opportunity to social distance. Potentially brings in folks who 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 have uh, have COVID nineteen exposure, even if asymptomatic. So we are asking families to really just bring in, um, you know, whoever is necessary for the move. So if it's mom and dad or or dad and junior or whoever. Um, and then as soon as materials are moved into the room, we're, we're asking parents to leave. So very different from what we're used to. But again, you know, it's all about trying to limit exposure on, on campus, enable students, faculty, and staff, you know, to be as healthy as possible to start the semester. And then this notion of, you know, experiential learning off campus. Um, this is something we're, we're doing very uh, carefully. Uh, any faculty member, any club, any organization that wants to go off campus, we're asking them to act, really kind of present the situation to a committee that will look carefully at it. Um, and uh, frankly, early in the semester, we're going to do little of that, uh, to make certain that we have the protocols on campus first. And then, you know, hopefully we'll find some things that we can test off, off campus. But we're going to do those very, very judiciously, again, just because we want to minimize you know, the, the introduction of, uh, potential introduction of COVID-19 to campus. So again, I, I don't like those answers, but as we focus on health and safety of on-campus and prioritize learning on campus, that, that's really key. And I think important just for me to say up front, um, you know, we'll be monitoring with our medical panel, the, the, the state of infection and so on. And there could come a circumstance in which we say, you know, we need to pivot to some other kind of learning, including possibly distance learning from home. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're only going to be open as long as the public health commissioner of Montgomery County says, you know, we appreciate the way you're doing it. We appreciate the students, the way they're behaving. We appreciate the protocols that faculty and staff are following. Stay open. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't do what's expected, we're, we're at risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Jen, anything you would like to add to that? No, I, I think Eric covered it. I, I will tell you this summer, one of my friends leads the Fitz Center for Leadership, and I know we had a, Eric, I think it was maybe 10 or 15 already established uh, fellows over the summer, and a lot of them were um, positioned to help with different nonprofits and um, outreach in the Dayton community, and if I'm recalling correct, almost all of them were able to fulfill their summer uh, piece by actually thinking about how they turned their engagement, whether it was with young children or a, a volunteer leadership group in the community into a more digital uh, remote setting. So, um, you know, I, I do think people are getting really creative about it. Uh, so I think while preferable to be able to get in there and kind of roll your sleeves up together and have those shared experiences, um, let's give our students a really big shout out for figuring out how to do this um, in a way that was meaningful to them. And I think over the summer has offered some really important outcomes for a lot of very needy organizations in our local region. So, um, yeah, I, I think we'll continue to see that kind of creativity. Thanks, Jen. Um, and Jen, I'm gonna come back to you uh, for this yeah. next question or next set of questions. You, you know, one of the things that I'm impressed with is how well all of the university leaders work together. And a question that, that often comes up um, when we're together at meetings is enrollment. And so as we think about, and so I'm giving you the softball, tell us you about are. enrollment trends uh, <laughs> for the fall and what you're seeing and, um, and, 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 and we'll, we'll just start there. And then Eric, if you have anything to add to that, but you know, what's enrollment like uh, given a lot of this uncertainty that UD is facing as well as higher ed? Yeah, oh, sorry. Thank, well, thanks for the softball. Eric will grade me on my response probably here. Um, so I'll tell you what my good buddy and Jason Reinhold enrollment management uh, really has shared with, with our president's cabinet leadership team. And, and that is, you know, we've had a very successful uh, enrollment season. And 
you know, if there's one silver lining for us, maybe in some of this is that we did not see uh, a significant, what we term summer melt, right? Students who maybe made a deposit or an initial commitment to us, but then, you know, in the end did not deposit, didn't actually fulfill on that and, and, and become uh, fully registered, you know, and ready to take classes. But we are seeing that trend uh, significantly. And as Jason has said, the quality of the class, you know, we've been very fortunate now, you know, for the four years I have been, uh, you know, here as well, just to, to see the wonderful quality of student, uh, whether it's uh, the leadership roles they've held, uh, the GPAs, the diversity, uh, you know, of socioeconomic backgrounds uh, that we've been able to tap, and even geographically, you know, um, while we have seen a little more trends towards, you know, people maybe wanting their family member, their student to stay a little closer to home, so maybe we've got a little bit uh, larger mix in terms of Ohio and the Midwest uh, than we might have, uh, you know, just two years ago. Uh, we continue to see UD's brand, you know, really um, be strong. And we had a lot of inquiries. Um, let's be frank, a successful basketball team, a lot of prominent, uh, you know, visibility doesn't hurt, uh, particularly at a time when there's a lot of applications coming in. But at the same time, I think the quality of the institution certainly speaks for itself. And we've, we've been very fortunate in that regard. And then in terms of the returning students, um, we have a very good percentage of those that are extremely eager to get back. Uh, and, you know, they've been highly responsive as we've surveyed them about the restart, as Eric indicated uh, uh, earlier, um, you know, indicating, you know, their level of enthusiasm for doing this well, doing this right, and being a part of being in person. So uh, I'm really excited. I mean, if you had to ask me, you know, I'm, I probably got three things I'm really excited about that, but that's one of them is uh, we're looking at a really, really vibrant set of uh, young individuals becoming part of uh, the Flyer family permanently. So how'd I do, Eric? I'd give that an A plus, Jen. Well, thanks. I'm a tough grader. No, I, I think the other two. There's, there's yeah. a lot of demand for, for, for UD education. Um, Jen, I'm going to come back to you because you said uh, enrollment was one of the things. What are the other two things that you're excited about? Oh, good. Now another softball. Um, so I'm really actually um, excited about the level of um, alumni and parent engagement that we've seen. Don't get me wrong, it was already really strong before this happened. But you know, think about all the uncertainty and what was amazing was with what kind of speed and frequency my team and other parts of campus heard from alumni, parents, friends of the university saying, what can I do? Help me understand what your biggest challenge is. How do I make sure that the students finish out the spring semester successful? And now their question is, what do you need me to do to make sure that their fall is remarkable despite all the changes or the challenges or what have you? Um, so I get really energized by that. You know, I mean, I think these times are really tough. And then if you watch the news and you take in too much of the bad stuff, you can really get yourself hung up on it. What I'm really enthusiastic about is this is a community that leads and lives what it talks about it's not one that just says something about it, but then when it comes to actually needing to do something, stands on the sidelines. So that's one of the things I'm really excited about. And then, you know, I just, I got to give a shout out to my team um, and to the wonderful volunteer leaders that they work with. And I'm not just saying that because Ray's on the screen or uh, I know a few other board members are on, the, on this. Um, you know, my, my team has been undeterred. Um, you know, they, they knew it would be a challenging finish to our fiscal year in terms of keeping people uh, engaged and feeling confident about the, the plans they had set forward with us, whether it was volunteering time, resources, or what have you. And uh, I'm just really proud of them. Um, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded with teammates who really care about the university and one another uh, and the people they serve every day. So that's my, my, that's my excitement list for the night. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, I respect you so much that I promised you a softball uh, as well. So uh, tell us about the financial forecast and, and the challenges you may have or how you're managing through this, uh, this um, COVID situation and the impact it's having to UD's finances. Yeah, so I mean, the, the good news is we finished last year. So we have a fiscal year that ends on June 30th in, in really good shape. Uh, you know, obviously the last three months of the year were, were really, really challenging from a revenue perspective. Um, you know, we sent students home and we uh, either credited them for room and board or, or refunded if they weren't coming back to, to campus. So that was a hit, but, but still we wound up in the black where we've been for, for many, many years. For, for the coming year, I mean, really the, the expenses are, are extraordinary. 
in terms of PPE testing and so on. I mean, well into the eight figures, um, ju just just for our, our our campus. So that gives you a sense of, uh, you know, really there is a, a lot of money we're going to be spending to try to keep our our students and faculty as safe as as possible. Um, we're taking some hit on revenue as well. So really new international students, we've pretty much zeroed out that, that number. Um, and then we're aware you know, many of our families have been affected by, uh, by, by employment action, whether layoffs or furloughs. So we, we've been, uh, we want to make certain all of our students can get back and all of our freshmen who want to come here are, are able to do so. We've, we've uh, provided a lot of financial aid to make certain that's, that's possible. So you know, we have a great CFO in, in Andy Horner and a, a great, great board of trustees, as you know, Ray. Um, so we're keeping them up to, up to date. Um, you know, th this university is in very good shape to survive this however long it, it, it goes. We're making good, good decisions, uh, making certain that we have the cash on hand that we need to. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, really, the year will be determined by whether or not we're able to keep students on campus for the whole semester. If, if, if we can't, it'll be more of a challenge. We'll still get, get through it. But, uh, you know, I, I would just say that, um, you know, our alums don't have to worry about the university going belly up. This is a period, for, you know, very frankly, where many institutions, this is an existential moment for them. It's, it's not for UD. We, we, we can't be silly about what we're doing. We have to be serious. We have to be focused. We have to be smart. But, uh, but UD's finances are strong no matter what happens this semester, e even if we were to run into the red, it would likely just be because of some of the extraordinary expenses that we have. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. And, and, I, and, and I will concur. I am amazed by the quality of leaders um, that we have on campus, both in, in their vocation of what they do. You mentioned Andy and others, but um, their love for UD and their desire to keep um, everyone safe um, and to steer the university through this crisis. I feel incredibly fortunate and have tremendous amounts of gratitude for the leaders that, that we have um, leading the university through this time. Um, I'll, I'll pivot slightly um, to uh, community. You know, so much of what makes UD a great place and what people remember are all the experiences they had on campus, whether it's intramurals or being part of a club um, and or just hanging out. And you talked about limits on gatherings. And so talk a bit about what you envision in the fall for what community would, will look like, what our students will experience um, outside of the classroom. Yeah, well, we're going to encourage students to continue to think about ways to interact with each other. And certainly the faculty and staff are thinking about ways that they're going to interact with students. So you know, I, I think the, the right thing to do is not compare it to the past, but let's just recognize the limitations that we have. We're going to be wearing masks. Uh, we're going to need to socially distance. We're going to limit the size of the groups that we're in. But, uh, you know, as we were talking to some students the other day, it doesn't mean that the student neighborhood can have multiple groups of 10 people socially distanced all throughout the neighborhood. It's just, you know, the kind of the mass gatherings and so on. We need to just be, we need to be careful about it. And that's in part for health, but also in part so the public health commissioner knows we're doing what we have to do in order to, to stay, stay safe. So, you know, from that perspective, I know the faculty and the staff, you know, certainly in student development, but also in other parts of the university are thinking about, you know, given the constraints, what are some new things that we can do or some things we've long do, long done, how do, how do we change them? So, you know, one great example, you know, it's the Catholic Marianist University, our faith life is really important to us. Uh, so, you know, campus ministry staff are really thinking about how do we continue to provide lots of opportunities for students to live their faith when we know, you know, that we aren't going to have a 10 o'clock and a 12 o'clock and a 6 o'clock and a 9 o'clock mass that are packed like they usually are. So is it more masses? Is it masses through video? Is it outdoor masses? So, you know, I, I think, you know, to your earlier point, Ray, that uh, we have a lot of good people working hard on these, these problems and these opportunities. We have a lot of good people working hard on ex exactly this. How do we support students? and make certain that even though it's different, the community they can build still is a UD community, a Catholic Marianist University, where interpersonal connections are really important. So I'm, I'm optimistic. And you know, one of the groups that's really gonna lead us here is, is students. We've had a lot of students on our various path forward working groups and they're, they're, they're brilliant. I mean, they're coming up with great ideas. Uh, they're working on marketing campaigns for students and so on. So I'm, 
you know, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of reason for optimism here. Awesome. Jen, anything from your perspective? No, I mean, you know, I, I, I echo what Eric's saying. And I think when I take, you know, the idea of community and apply it and think about our alumni communities, and I know, Ray, we'll talk a lot about this at Alumni Leadership Conference in the coming weeks. You know, we're really going to you know, be careful about assessing our programming for the fall, as I mentioned before, even in local communities. We'll have to abide by what's happening in that in terms of public health standards. I mean, obviously, um, in Seattle, you might face different challenges than we do in Dayton, Ohio, right? Um, and so I think that's one piece. I think the other two is, um, you know, we're going to try to continue to put robust programming together around career development, uh, well, even though digitally, um, you'll probably see a step away from a little bit of the social. But one of the things I want to put on people's radar tonight is think about this. The students are going to come home in Thanksgiving. Um, they're going to be back in these great, wonderful, vibrant UD communities. Um, and as, you know, we talked about earlier, you know, we hope that as things transition forward uh, and, we, and we get a sense of how to kind of do some of the things we're used to, maybe within some of the communities, we may be able to define service opportunities that would be affiliated with maybe Christmas off campus that would allow alumni, again, you know, to make students feel very connected um, and to understand what it means to have a relationship with the university and to experience that community even once you graduate. So um, I would just take it maybe that one step further. Awesome. Um, so one of the things that, again, is going back to community, we have a pretty broad and diverse Dayton community that, um, that borders the campus. So whether that's restaurants or other establishments, um, uh, we have some housing that's not owned by the university. So how have you been proactive in talking to those um, partners about how you will work together this fall on campus and around campus? Yes, yeah, so our, our, our folks, especially in student development, have been, have been really proactive. Those conversations have been going on since, again, since a April, April, May. Um, you know, so the, the um, expectations that have been set in the city of Dayton and Montgomery County and now, now in Ohio really kind of lean into where we need to be as a campus as well in terms of social distancing, mask wearing, and so on. So, you know, we have long relationships with these, these businesses. We want them to, to thrive. So we certainly want students to continue to, uh, to, to utilize their, their services. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm prepared for us to, you know, continue to have strong partnerships there. And we want these businesses to stay open. And our students will understand that, you know, expectations off campus really are very similar to the on campus in terms of, you know, the protocols that need to be followed to make certain that, that, that they stay safe and, and healthy. You know, and that, that's one of the things that maybe I should have mentioned when we talked about, uh, you know, how campus was going to look. Um, you know, much like my, my wife and myself and my kids at, at home, we're not wearing masks, we're not socially distancing. Uh, when we go out, out of the house, we, we are. Um, this is our household. So we're setting up households at the university and students will understand it, that, you know, if you're in, a, in, in Founders Hall, your roommate is your household. So no mask, no social distancing. Uh, your apartment mates, those are, that's your household. Your house uh, in the student neighborhood, that, that's, your, that's your household. And, and I think part of commitment to community, commitment to each other is understanding, you know, when I go off campus, when I go down to Panera, on, uh, on Marshall Street, I'm going to make certain that I'm social distancing, wearing a mask, not putting myself in a difficult position because my household, my roommate, my roommates, th their health depends upon what I'm doing when I'm off campus. So we really hope to have these things re re reinforce each other. So, so again, even if students are off campus, we, we hope they're thinking about their roommates, their friends, their classmates, their favorite professor, their favorite uh, um, person in Mary Crest Dining Hall and so on. Thanks, Eric. Um, a slight pivot, um, you know, and something that's important to me, uh, I, I lead a recruiting function for Microsoft and we've, um, UD and many other universities have graduated students into a global pandemic and an economic slowdown. So what's been the impact on job searches, job placement, both for full-time and for interns um, that are graduating from UD or, or, or students at UD, co-ops as well? Yeah, Jen, you want to take that or you want me to? I'm, I'm happy to. 
Well, why don't you talk a little bit about the career center and then I can talk a little bit about, you know, uh, some of the response we've gotten from alums, you know, when things shifted so quickly. Yeah. So the career center, you know, as always has been really terrific working with students, understanding it's a different environment, uh, helping students understand how to navigate, you know, a full set of interviews that are, that are just going to be via, via zoom or other internet technologies. You know, what I would say the outcome has been is, you know, UD has, uh, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of employers who know the quality of our students, the quality of our alums. So we really haven't seen much of a fall off. Now, you know, some of the job starts for our graduating students have been pushed off. Some of the internships have been a month rather than three months. You know, but an awful lot have pivoted to on online experiences uh, that the student is interacting with people via, via you know, uh, fellow em employees via, via Zoom. Um, or, um, you know, some certainly are, are, are working in, in person. But again, we've seen this demand for, for UD students uh, in terms of internships for, for UD gr graduates. That's, that's really gratifying. There's no doubt there's been some impact, in, especially in some disciplines. But, uh, you know, most of the students who were hired before uh, the pandemic had, you know, f followed through with those internships and jobs. Great. Yeah, Ray, I mentioned earlier, you know, the response that we had seen from alumni and parents who kind of, uh, you know, wanted to know what they could do. And this was one of the areas, of course, that they kind of immediately went to, right? You know, with our graduating seniors, what was happening with their career placement, uh, you know, with our returning students, what, what was going on with internships. And, you know, I think that was one of the areas that we saw some immediate early uh, impact where people were able to, whether it was with their own company or things they were seeing in their own community, um, that had moved into more of a digital um, piece, they were quickly identifying those for us so that we could feed them uh, to the career center, to different departments and schools and so forth. So I really appreciate that. We had some of our school and unit advisory councils who uh, kind of personally took it as a mandate to, you know, to kind of look after their particular school students and to, to find new opportunities for that handful who were displaced. Um, you know, so I, th I think that was really big. And then the other thing they stepped forward to do was really to mentor. So we've launched uh, Flyer Connect, which is a, a big mentoring platform, which allows you to really kind of define your level of engagement that you want to have in the student to do their same. And you know, I think one of the things we have to understand is this is an unprecedented time, you know, and I think there's some curiosity about what we're going to learn from it, how we're going to, uh, you know, as Eric said, when the next pandemic comes along, how do we you know, take what we've learned, uh, whether that's two years, 10 years, or 20 years from now, let's make it 20, I'm retired at that point. But you get my, you know, you get what I'm saying in the sense that um, we, we've seen questions and, and, and we've seen students seek help from mentors on that alumni platform. And I think we'll see more of them to say, how are you dealing with this? I mean, I, you talked about what happened to you at Microsoft and how you guys flipped things around in less than 72 hours. It's a remarkable story, and I think they're going to be student takeaways for understanding how they can process this and, you know, and think about their own resiliency and their own adaptability, um, you know, in, in this process. So I hope we capture some of those, some of those stories and some of those interactions, but that's, that's really how alums have stepped forward. Thanks to you both. It's, it's remarkable how companies, universities, and students have all um, reacted to what's going on. We have thousands of interns who had planned to come to Redmond for the summer who are now working at home and having a great experience. We will have what we call our intern signature event on Friday. And, and we've, you know, in the past had bands like Foo Fighters and Dave Matthews, and we'll have a big lineup on Friday, but it'll all be done in the comfort of their home using Teams uh, to watch. And so it's amazing that everyone's been able to, to pivot so quickly. Um, one of the questions, there's a couple of questions that talk about testing and how we'll keep our students safe. Um, and so Eric, if you wouldn't mind talking about, you talked about households and how you'll define households. What will happen if a student tests positive and, and how confident are you that you'll have the right surveillance so that when a student gets sick, we'll be able to quickly identify um, and react to it? Yeah, so uh, when, when a student is sick, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, um, they'll really have a choice to work with the families, work with the health center. I mean, if a student wants to go home, if a parent wants a student home, we can certainly arrange that. But we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll have isolation housing on, on campus uh, where students will, uh, will be uh, supported in terms of their, their health needs. Uh, 
but also in terms of you know bringing meals and, and so on. So that's you know talking about uh, you know both kind of quarantine housing, which can be done in uh, in some spaces, but also isolation housing, uh, and then really making certain that we we support those students. Thank you. Um, I'm reading through questions, and and while I'm scrolling through, I'd love to ask both of you. Both of you. Uh, came elsewhere uh, to UD. So what excited you about UD and what surprised you about UD once you got here? You wanna go first, Jen? Oh no, I'm gonna let you take that one first, go ahead. Well, I mean, the reason I came here very simply is because of the, the, the people. I mean, really beginning with my first interview, the kinds of interactions that I had with the search committee, which was a very large search committee, faculty, staff, students, trustees, alumni, I could tell it was a different place. The questions they asked, the way they interacted with me, the way they interacted with each other, um, you know. So that that's really been the, the really the most um, most exciting thing that really drives me on a day to day basis. My interaction with UD people, my interaction with flyers. Uh, the biggest surprise for me, uh, I mean, University of Dayton was a secret to me. I spent you know an awful long time at, at Syracuse. I I didn't understand the exceptional quality, not only of the people, but of the academic programs, the experiential learning, the research on campus. Um, you know, and I've been here now four years, so I've seen an awful lot, but for the first couple of years, literally every day I would see something new that would impress me in terms of, you know, it's overwhelming quality. And I, you know, I hadn't known that. That is one of the things we're trying to do is make certain that word of our quality, word of our excellence uh, really is out there a little bit more. Jen, All right. I, yeah, it's my it's mine. So um, I would say, you know, what excited me was the opportunity. Um, you know, I could say the same thing of people, but I'll I'll, I'll take it a little uh, broader to say, you know, I, I felt like as I engaged with the people from UD about what they wanted to see happen with uh, our alumni relations, our parent programming, our um, overall engagement strategy, and and yes, our fundraising. Um, you know, I, I felt like there was a real untapped opportunity and that there was a real energy around that. And so that excited me, the idea that together we could figure out a way to cap that excitement and actually turn it into something extremely impactful for, the, for those individuals and for the institution. Um, and that definitely has been the case. So that, that was really big. I think, you know, beyond, as Eric said, the excellence of the institution or whatever is a surprise maybe of the depth of the relationship that um, the graduates and the students and the faculty and staff feel for this institution. Um, when you have been part of different universities, you experience that um, at different levels. And I came from two that had a great connection uh, with their population for sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I've, I've said this before in, in some other leadership settings, um, UD alumni don't treat it just like they're a graduate. They really treat it like they're a citizen of the university, um, like they're part of making something happen and that they want to be a part of the conversation when something's going well as well as when something's going wrong. And I think of that as more a citizenship versus a sense of graduate and entitlement, right? You know, and um, that's been a wonderful, wonderful surprise. Um, some days it makes the, the conversation a little more uh, interactive, shall we say, but at the same time, it, it, it certainly makes our wins that much richer, you know, so that would probably be my big surprise. Awesome. Um, so what are, what's your favorite spot on UD's campus? Jen, go. I'm going to ask some my rapid favorite, fire questions. My favorite spot, um, honestly, it's sitting over there near Aubon Pan and listening to the students come in and talk about their days and uh, watching them, you know, t test and quiz each other. I love the sense of energy and buzz. Um, so um, for me, that's my favorite space on campus because it's just constant motion. One, one clarifying question, because we may have some alums who have not been on campus for a while. Oh, fair enough. Hey, KU. KU. You. <laughs> KU. KU. <laughs> KU near food. That's where you're going to find the students and that's where you're going to find the action. So, so for me, I'm going to give two answers. So if there's one single stationary spot, Serenity Pines. I love Serenity Pines over by, uh, over by Mary, Mary Crest. The other thing is, is a movable spot. Uh, so Karen and I in a typical semester will be in, my wife Karen and I will be invited to a number of different um, houses, student, uh, student houses in the student neighborhood for, for dinner. Um, you know, oftentimes four or five times a semester, sitting around the kitchen table, 
with a group of five or six students hearing their stories, hearing about their journey to and through UD, um, hearing about the way they're living intentionally. So that kitchen table is actually my favorite spot and it, it moves. That's great. That's great. Jen, I'm reminded that, you know, as I looked at the folks that were on the call, we have a range of decades represented. Um, I'm not going to ask you who your second favorite graduating class is, because we all know 1993 is the all-time favorite class. I see my uh, classmate Ramona Kristen uh, on, on, on this call. But when you talk to alums, what are some of the themes that you hear uh, in terms of like what they feel has changed or what's different? And how do you spend some time helping them understand kind of what UD is and what hasn't changed? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's really um, a great question. I think, you know, the thing that I hear people resonate with is some of the core values that they learned uh, through kind of the Marianist educational framework, right? You know, and what's amazing to me is, you know, to sit there and you can be talking to an alum that's 30 or 40 years out who has led a major international corporation and they talk about how their own leadership style, even though they didn't realize it right away, uh, was informed by how they learned how to treat people when they were back on UD's campus, right? And I, and then you hear a 2015 grad who just got their first supervisory job talk about the same thing, right? You know, and how working in teams and living in a community and dealing with conflict when you didn't agree with your, you know, your housemates about something or what have you, um, how they've deployed that as they've led their first team project or what have you. Um, and so I think those are some things that, you know, I hear with some consistency that, you know, the, the values um, the fact that there was always someone there to help, whether it was uh, someone that was, you know, helping serve them at lunchtime that just happened to ask how their day was, uh, you know, to a favorite professor that took extra time to mentor them personally. Um, that, that level of personal care and touch seems to permeate class years. So those would be some of the things I think that are resonating. And I would say to you that I think those are some of the things that are evergreen for us, right? You know, and they should be. Um, I think some of the things that have changed are is let's face it the students who come to our campus face a myriad of pressures and challenges and i'm not even talking about COVID at this point around their physical mental uh you know and social health that um you know quite frankly thinking back to when i went to school and i'll age myself here i'm about to do my 30th reunion you know we we didn't face it. it just wasn't part of our reality day in and day out anything and so the university does have to adapt whether it's the resources we put behind them the structures we build with alumni you know to provide them networks of support um, i think that's that's radically different i think the other thing is we understand a lot more about how people learn effectively um, and some of the traditional ways in which we teach and, and some of the experiences we might have offered 10, 20, 30 years ago were wonderful in those time periods, um, but they're not possible and, and they're not how our current population learns best. And so I do think it's hard, right? I mean, anything that we all hold dear, I don't care if it's a, you know, if it was a shared experience in particular, right, for a class, you, you mentioned class, and I'm not going to go to favorite class years, you're right. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's important to understand just how deeply rooted those are. And I never want to tell somebody that those traditions and those things that they love are, are necessarily not part of what makes us a very rich tapestry and serves a very rich history. We can take some of those pieces forward with us, but we really, you know, we have to be able to flex and respond you know, to what our students need today. And, you know, and, and that's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to kid you. And, I, and uh, I think, again, that care for individual is where that comes out, right? Because if we're all committed to making sure every UD student has the best possible and fullest experience, then it's pretty easy, right, to do the right thing, you know, whether it's in a classroom or in a social setting or what have you. So um, hopefully that came close to answering what you wanted. That's that was great. And, it, and it's a great reminder of a discussion that we had in January around our students' mental well-being. And I wish that every alum could hear the energy, passion um, that every UD leader, every UD faculty has on this topic. So, and, and I walked away, Eric, um, when we talked about this, that your deep affinity for ensuring that the students' well, mental well-being um, is something that the university supports and provides resources. Can you just tell us a bit about, you know, what you see relative to the challenges that students see on campus today and what the university is doing to respond to it? 
Yeah, so, I mean, there's no doubt that that is a big challenge for every university, for every high school, for every grade school these days. Um, and, you know, one of the, you know, beyond the caring faculty and staff, beyond the holistic environment on campus, I think one of our biggest advantages is our, our students. So our students are very in tune with students. Uh, I, I can't even count how many different groups there are on campus that are focused on advocating for, supporting students and their, and their men mental health and helping them get through you know, a stre stressful time in, in their, their lives. So you know, that interaction with students, the advocates and others, I think has helped us over time can continue to adapt, right? There's no doubt the kinds of programs that we offer, uh, the kinds of group sessions that we offer for, for students are different today than they were two years ago different two years ago than they were four years ago, in large part because you know, folks in student development and others are listening carefully to students, understanding what the needs are um, and how, how best to support them. So um, you know, this is something that's gonna get to continue to evolve. You know, we've learned as other universities have, it's not something you can just throw money at, right? You really need to be thoughtful, strategic, uh, last year, year yeah, about a little bit of more than a year ago, um, we did something called the Healthy Mind Survey. That uh, participation rate of students was very high, but in, in large part to try to get a sense of you know, kind of where students saw themselves in terms of their mental health uh, while, while they're on campus as college students. And, and that has really been useful in helping to tune, and, and will continue to be to helping to tune um, our, our support for students. That's great. Thanks both um, for that. Um, Eric, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was the getting more familiar with UD and the things that surprised you. And one of your points of emphasis was um, helping the broader world know about UD's academic strength. So talk a bit about like how um, you and, and the rest of the leadership team, um, the academic leaders, get that message out there about the overall quality of the UD education. Well, I mean, the, 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 the best way is the folks who are on this, this Zoom call, right? So our, our alumni, um, our young alumni, as they, they go out there, I mean, they are our representatives, right? So that, that's how people know that UD graduates can you work for a large company like Microsoft and make it better, you can work for a small startup and make it, make it, make it better. So um, you know, I think that's mo most, most important. Um, but, but also you're making certain that we have the best faculty, that we're retaining those faculty, that we're recruiting the best faculty. And, and you know, when I say best faculty, I don't mean the biggest names. I mean the folks who, you know, really who understand what it means to be at UD, who are looking for the opportunities to work closely with students, who are engaged with them, not just in the classroom, but also through experiential learning. And it is through that experiential learning that I think that's one of our biggest advantages compared to a lot of schools. It's very deep, it's very broad. You see so many students take deep advantage of it. And that, that really gives our students, you know, the extraordinary opportunities that they can, you know, whether it's applying to graduate school or applying to med school or applying to a company, uh, they can say, look, I, I work for Flyer Enterprise. I, I ran a division. Um, I, I work for Flyer Consulting. I developed a business plan or marketing plan for a, a not-for-profit. Not so, you know, students who come to UD generally really get involved in things that are outside the classroom, which I think is one of the ways that we really get the word out that our students can do it. Our students are leaders. Our students really are able to uh, be agile and help both small and large employers, um, you know, make the progress they need to in a complex world. Thanks. I, I was reflecting this morning about, um, this, this panel, this, this discussion, and was thinking about what I enjoyed most about UD and what was most meaningful to me. And it was really the points that you just made, Eric. Um, I, I thought about sitting in Father Putka's classes in political science and the way that he taught, it was less about um, what you could memorize, but more about critical thinking. And, um, and there was a tremendous amount of pressure that he put uh, on all the students in the class and it was hard. Um, and it, it, it enabled us to rise to that level. He had really high expectations of what we would achieve in that classroom. Then I think about what I do every day at work. And it's really, I, I didn't realize it then, what he was preparing us for now, the pressure that we have, your critical thinking skills, how do you approach a problem? How do you use your teammates or classmates um, to excel? 
And I'm so appreciative of that education that I get. It's not a particular class or particular test or moment, but it was the faculty and staff really pushing us to think differently and think hard. And that's something I, I, that I value so much uh, about UD. Um, we're coming close to time. So I'm just gonna ask uh, a couple questions in a group and either one of you uh, could take them. And it's really about, um, as the fall goes on, if you, how would you transition from uh, class model to online or hybrid? And then uh, what would happen if you, you know, send students home? Would there be some tuition reimbursement and those things? And so I'll couple, couple those together, then I'll come back and close. Yeah, so, you know, as we have been, um, you know, really as the faculty in particular have been working on uh, preparing for this coming semester from the beginning it's been i'm going to prepare as if we're going to be on campus all the time but i'm also going to prepare if we need to if we need to pivot quickly but let's face it this past spring it was very quick pivot to on online learning so um you know th th there's no doubt our faculty are much more prepared today than they were on march uh, march 9th last year so it'll be it'll be difficult in terms of us coming to terms with it I think in terms of the quality of the education, in terms of the, um, the plans that faculty have for how to engage students, uh, will we'll be quite, quite seamless if, if we need, need to make that move. And if we send students home, you know, at some point in the semester, certainly if they're not using dining, if they're not using housing, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. You know, we do think from a tuition perspective, you know, it's a Dayton degree, they're Dayton credits, we have faculty working hard, we have you know, a lot of infrastructure behind uh, st strong, strong ed ed education for our students. That you know, we think our tuition should should be where it is, and we're, you know, we provide an awful lot of financial aid to students, especially this year. Uh, but certainly, as we think about housing and dining, it's something that we'd have to take into consideration. Awesome, um, uh, Jen. What's your favorite UD memory thus far? My favorite UD memory thus far. Uh, all right, I'm going to go for non-sports. Um, I'm going to have to say um, our first commencement. Um, it was pretty, I'm going to tell a story on Eric really quick. Um, I, you know, I, my last job, I was, I was the number two, not the number one. So I didn't sit up on stage, right? I didn't get to hug anybody or shake any hands. And so, you know, my first year or what have you, you know, here I am and I'm looking out of this sea of wonderful glowing faces and, uh, and thinking about everything they've accomplished and, you know, and, and, and hoping that, you know, we played a small role in something, you know, that, that made that all uh, happen. But as we were exiting the building, you know, Eric high-fived me and said, all right, we took care of them while they were here. They're all yours now. And I thought, <laughs> this is awesome. I mean, you know, I, and, 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 I, and I think, you know, um, I could name others and most of them would have some sports associated with it. I think, I think that, uh, you know, just really sums it up, right? Because I looked out all of that face, all of those faces, and there was such hope. Uh, there was such uh, huge plans. There was such accomplishment. And to think that these were amazing young people who were going to, over time, hopefully, if we did our job right, they were going to have a great relationship with this university long after I'm gone. And, um, you know, it, it just, it, 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 it's still, I'm thinking about it. It just gives me a rush. So they're mine. You're mine. <laughs> Eric, your favorite UD memory. Uh, that, that's unfair. I'm going to give you three. <laughs> but it's, it's hard. It's hard to top the feeling in the arena after that George Washington game, when oh. uh, when the men's basketball team clinched. I mean, that was the the roof was coming off the place. I mean, those three Obi Toppin dunks, bang, bang, bang. Uh, it was just really a special moment. That was a very special team. So that's that's one. Um, every commencement, I would say, and then um, really interacting with with new students as they arrive kind of, as my father would say, br bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, right? That they're ready, they're ready to go, they're excited to be at UD, and just knowing what's in front of them in terms of this Dayton Flyer community, faculty and staff who are dedicated, who are here because they want to help them find their vocation, find their path in the world. So, you know, that kind of first day, that last day, and then, then one, one, one sporting event. Awesome. One, one last question before we close, because um, everyone's picked up, I think, a new hobby or skill during COVID. So what's the new thing that you've uh, picked up? Is it making sourdough bread? Is it you've started hiking? Uh, what's your thing that you've, you've picked up? So I'll, I'll go first. We'll let Jen think. So there's two things. So my, 
I have a son who just graduated from college, so he's been home with us since mid mid March, and then her daughter has been locked out of her job at Chicago, and she's been been working here since uh, since about the same same time. Um, you know, usually spring for me is a time when Karen and I are out at one event or another literally every night, so we never eat at home. Um, but we were eating at home every night, and you know, oftentimes after after dinner, we would go watch um, on Netflix the great. British baking show. <laughs> so we have now watched every single season. I'm sad. We finished the last one the other day and I'm sad that it's over. And then the other thing is Karen and I have taken a lot more walks around the neighborhood in the last three months, probably cumulatively than, than we have in the previous four years. That's great. Jen? Okay, so my success, unsuccessful foray into paddle boarding. And if anyone knows my lack of uh, balance and coordination skills, they can only imagine what the videos might look like. So um, I'm working on it, but it's not pretty. So uh, paddle boarding. Awesome. And, and I, for those of you that, that are on social media, know that I've just really focused on cooking and, and uh, making lots of great barbecue. Um, and I can so attest, I follow him. <laughs> His, what, what he's making, we all want to have. He he's, has a smoker. <laughs> he's, he's cooking. Well, this has been uh, a lot of fun, and I'll come back to you both for some closing remarks, but just a couple things. One, um, thanks to all the alums that, that joined, uh, joined in. Hopefully you found it as enjoyable and as informative as I did. There are lots of different ways for you to get involved with the Alumni Association. I encourage you to go out and check out the Alumni Association page um, on the udayton.edu site. Um, this series, this U Digital series has been amazing and what a great way to connect. And we have a couple sessions coming up. We have a cooking on Instagram Live that's coming up on 729. And then a conversation with Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley, who many of you have, uh, have seen um, as a UDA alum, and that's coming up on August 26. So I'd encourage you to, to join in for those. And there's also a lot of great recorded content already uh, on ranges like professional development. So go check out that great content. But once again, Eric and Jen, thank you so much uh, for doing this. I think it's just yet another uh, example of how well the Alumni Association and uh, our current UD administration is working hand in hand. And so I really love uh, the time that you provided. So I'll leave closing comments to the two of you. Jen, I'll, I'll start with you and then Eric, I'll ask you to close us out. Yeah, I just want to express gratitude again for folks who are involved, whether you're listening to this live or uh, and submitted questions or you're listening to the recording um, and just encourage you to stay engaged. Um, you know, uh, what you can do, whether it's with your time, your expertise, your resources, no matter how little uh, or how big, you know, you being involved makes an enormous difference. Uh, so uh, in, in the lives of the university and lives of our students. And so um, just stay there and, uh, you know, be, be active and know that the Flyer family is as strong as ever. Yeah, so just a couple things for me. One is, um, you know, if, if you enjoy this, if you think this is a good, good format, let, let us know. Uh, certainly, we can we can do this again or do it on some some frequency. Um, say say thank you for staying engaged with the university. There's nothing more important. It's a difference between a great university and a good university is the engagement of alums with with the university, um, holding us accountable, supporting us in multiple ways, be, being involved. And the last thing that I'll say is. Um, you know, we're in a difficult situation right now as a, as a, as a country, as a, as a world community in terms of the pandemic, um, you know, disproportionate impacts in, in certain areas that are really important to the institution. Um, we're gonna have a really challenging semester, even if things go, go really well and people are, people are gonna get, get sick. Um, there's gonna be challenges, I'm sure, around every, every corner. I, I would just ask uh, alums to, to keep us in your prayers as, as an institution. We're going to every day work really hard, uh, you know, ab abide by our values as a university, uh, focus on our guiding principles. Um, but, you know, we are a faith-based institution. We're Catholic Marianist University. We take that seriously. Um, if you'll keep us as a community in your prayers, we'll, we'll certainly appreciate that and know, know it'll make a difference. Awesome. Well, once again, on behalf of all the alums, thank you. Um, if you didn't know it now, uh, I, I think we are so fortunate to have both Jen and Eric as leaders of this institution. Um, you should walk away with 
from this conversation having the utmost confidence that we have tremendous leadership that will guide us through uh, not only these times but any challenges that are forthcoming. So uh, on behalf of all the alumni, Eric, Jen, thank you so much. And to everyone, go Flyers. Yeah, go Flyers. Go Flyers. <laughs> Good night. Good night.